Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with Sox Healthcare Communications. Before I introduce our moderator, Bridget Joseph, and our speaker, Dr. Matt Levy, I'd like to show our audience how to send in questions and comments. You can submit questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Our moderator today is Bridget Joseph. Dr. Joseph is the CEO of Thrive In LLC, a healthcare consulting business. She is a certified clinical nurse specialist and resuscitation nurse specialist. She has implemented many quality improvement initiatives and published research related to all aspects of resuscitation. She has previously worked as a Director of Simulation Education. Additionally, she has worked in a variety of fields and specialties as a legal nurse expert consultant and interprofessional education consultant. Dr. Joseph has been an invited speaker at numerous medical conferences. Bridget, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you, Tracy, for such a lovely introduction. Um, I want to introduce our speaker today for this webinar entitled Building the Next Generation of People Behind the Systems of Emergency Care. It's Dr. Matt Levy. And Dr. Levy is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Surgery at Johns Hopkins University, as well as an attending emergency physician at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He holds several, I'm telling you several, positions, including Deputy Director of Emergency Medicine Special Operations and Associate EMS Fellowship Director. Dr. Levy is a very experienced EMS medical director and physician responder. He's the chief medical officer for the Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Services, president of Maryland chapter of the National Association of EMS Physicians, amongst many, many other professional activities. He's published over 80 original manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals and has contributed to many textbook chapters. Dr. Levy is a highly sought after speaker and has presented over 50 US and worldwide lectures. And we are exceedingly lucky to have him with us here today. He has disclosed the following, that he is a consultant with Stryker Education. Um, and I wanna give you guys a little bit of, uh, you know, a tidbit about our continuing education credits before we jump into uh, Dr. Levy's talk today. So our educational activity is approved for one contact hour um, and a link to obtain your CE credits will be available at the end of the webinar today. So we are giving co uh, continuing education credits for nurses, EMS professionals and respiratory therapists. And you could read all the exciting news about the accreditation uh, statements and support for the educational activity is provided today by Stryker. So without much further ado, I will turn this over to Dr. Levy. All right, well, good afternoon and greetings, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules and busy days uh, to chat or to listen to me chat for a few minutes uh, about a topic that I'm really, really passionate about, which is uh, which are the future workforce members and what the future of tomorrow's systems of emergency care will look like. Uh, this is really exciting to me. Uh, I consider myself, and, and Bridget, thank you for the kind words and the very warm introduction. I consider myself a systems person at heart, and I consider myself to be an implementation person at heart. And I spent a lot of time in my, in my various roles and in my various uh, opportunities to collaborate and work with people from across disciplines and across sectors, thinking about how we can do things not just better, but do things in a way that results in a better outcome for our patients. And that's really why I think we're all here today. It's because we want the best outcomes possible. And I suppose that that's one of the themes that's going to emerge over the next 45 or so minutes as we talk about systems of care and what all that means. But before we get into it, I want to give you some background information here, and I want to give you a little bit of background perspective. This is one of my favorite quotes and one of my favorite proverbs, uh, and it goes something like this. The best time to plant a tree was really 20 years ago, but the second best time is right now. So what does that mean? What is that really try? What are we trying to say here? That's a very deep statement, but it's also a very practical one, right? So, so if we knew what we knew now, 20 years ago, there's a good chance we might have do, been doing some things differently or something's better. But as 
things innovate, as scientific discoveries continue to grow, as technologies continue to expand, we need to be able to lay a foundation, right? And so when you plant a tree, you plant a seed. You, you, you fertilize and cultivate the ground. You create an environment for growth and opportunity and energy. And that's really what we're talking about today. We're really talking about how do we do that in a way while everything else is going on around us. OK, so um, uh, so so we can we can uh, we can wax philosophical all we want. But think about that for me and think about how this concept might be something you can embrace in your leadership roles, because every single one of you joining today is a leader. You're a leader in some capacity. And that's another another key element that I hope you take away from this talk. So what do I hope to accomplish in the next few minutes? Well, first and foremost, we're going to talk about emergency medical care and emergency medical systems of care. And we're going to really start off by, by speaking to and understanding what are those common examples of the quintessential systems of emergency care that we think about. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the workforce challenges and complexities that we know exist that we know we're facing and how those could be both barriers but also opportunities for the future and then we're going to talk about strategies to cultivate educate and empower the up and coming next generation of pre-hospital workforce members those who are just starting off now and those who are thinking about joining the workforce so let's get right into it First and foremost, let's think about our modern EMS and emergency care system, right? It's it's about 50 or so years old at this point, quite candidly, and, and it gets its roots and its heritage from a couple of different places. Uh, the trauma system, which is arguably one of the first comprehensive systems of care uh, in North America, in parts of Europe and other parts of the world, this system evolved from military and armed conflicts and lessons learned and the concept of the golden hour. Now, the golden hour concept is really interesting in a lot of different, for a lot of different reasons. And, and this notion that, that the clock is ticking is really important and really central to what we're talking about. Time is of the essence and time criticality and interventions that occur in a certain amount of time is really the cornerstone of an emergency care system. And we have to balance a couple of things with this time issue, right? We have to balance not only the ability and desire to rapidly transport, uh, via cutting edge transportation methodologies and mechanisms, but also the interventions that we can perform and when should they be performed. And at the core of this is a cadre of specially trained, highly educated professionals that are operating resources that have been pre-staged and pre-positioned uh, in a manner that makes them rapidly deployable and accessible uh, so that we can deliver not only the best evidence uh, driven treatment, but also uh, not forgetting our goal of positively affecting patient outcomes. This, everybody, is the why. It's the why behind why we're thinking about this stuff and why these systems exist to begin with. Let's keep going. Before we talk about systems of care, I want to spend just a moment or two talking about systems as a whole. And systems are not new. Systems ex have existed for, for a long time, but the science behind systems and systems innovation and development is really neat and really has applicability both in healthcare, in industry, and in multiple different sectors. When we think about a systems-based approach to problems, what we're really thinking about are looking at the entirety or the totality or a system as a whole, not necessarily the parts of that system separately. So take that one step further. What does that mean? It means uh, you can have all the pieces there, but if they're not assembled properly and integrated properly, they're just not going to work. And indeed, it's really when we talk about performance and we talk about how a system performs in whatever its objective goal is, what we're really thinking about is how do these parts come together to affect a given mission, to change a given outcome? Said another way, a system simply can't be divided up into its various independent parts and still affect its mission or essential properties. But you know what's interesting? The opposite is also not true. If you take one of those key parts out of the system, it doesn't work either. So it's a little bit of both. Dr. Russell Acoff is a 
famous systems uh, engineer and leader. And there are there are some really neat videos of him from a time long ago on YouTube that you can find. Uh, very interesting perspective. Uh, and and he he very eloquently states that a system is simply not the sum of the behavior of its parts, but it's really the product of those parts and their, how they interact with one another. So really, as we talk about systems and we talk about all the elements, we know it's about how all these parts fit together. So let's use an example if we can for just a second. What am I talking about here? Let's talk for just a minute about us building uh, the best ambulance possible. All right, so this is an emergency care talk. Let's talk about us building the best ambulance possible. And we go to the top half a dozen ambulance vendors in the country, and we like this light bar, and we like this stretcher, and we like this suction device, and we like this box, and this chassis, and this radio system. And we order one of the best of everything, and we have it show up. And there it is in the garage, uh, at the fire station, or in the, EMB, in the EMS headquarters. And all the pieces are there but someone's got to assemble it. Someone's got to get them to work together. And someone has to make sure that these pieces work together in a manner that actually affect the goal, which is building an ambulance. Now, now that's, a, that, that's a little bit of a metaphoric example, but you could see exactly what I'm talking about there. And, and Dr. Akoff did just an amazing job of explaining that. Let's, let's take this one step further now, and let's talk about systems of care in medicine. Because the term systems of care really transcends a variety of healthcare delivery models. And it's not just emergency and resuscitation care. We have a unique challenge in our given work and in our given specialty of emergency care, because in the back of everything we're doing, the back of our mind is the clock ticking. And we have to make sure these systems come together and come together in a manner uh, where, where time is not only not wasted, but that time is conserved. So um, if you've never heard uh, uh, Mick Gunderson speak, I would highly encourage you. He, he's a brilliant guy. And Mick goes on to say that what differentiates higher and lower performing systems of care is how the pieces are made to fit together. Again, not how well each piece works individually. We can look at individual elements of system performance to guide and to optimize those elements, but if we're not looking at the big picture, we're not going to achieve our overall goal and objective. So you've heard me say a few things so far. You've heard me say that systems are amalgamations or compilations of individual components, and how well they work really depends upon how well we can get them to all fit together and interface with one another. Beyond that, how well they can do that towards a common goal of affecting a positive outcome for patients. And oh yeah, by the way, in a manner uh, that not only preserves time, but is, is efficient, but also helps us realize and maybe even gain time back. And I'd like you to think amongst yourself as you're listening to my talk about the various systems of emergency care that you may interact with in the course of your professional work and think about how what I just said either helps or hinders or may uh, may inform your system and its evolution. So let's now talk about emergency medical systems of care. Let's talk about this in the world that we live in in emergency care and resuscitation. So when we think about this kind of stuff, we know that the best outcomes for our patients occur when things work smoothly, efficiently, effectively, and, and are centered in patient driven outcomes and metrics. And as a result of that, we have some very sophisticated and advanced emergency medical care systems uh, that, that start off with integrated and comprehensive public safety and healthcare system models, where those two systems are thought not individually as separate, but as one. And they are indeed part of what we would consider the larger emergency health services or EHS system. Uh, EHS may be a term you're not familiar with, but it encompasses everything uh, from uh, the 911 pre-hospital sector through uh, primary receiving facilities, such as uh, local or community emergency departments, uh, through inter-facility transport, and then more comprehensive specialty or tertiary care centers. And these systems are not only interrelated, but they're also interdependent. As you've heard me say, they only work when they work, they only they will only affect a positive outcome when they work together. And they will continuously influence each other to not only maintain their activity and existence, but a change in one can have a ripple effect and a change in another. 
But at the end of the day, they have a shared goal. And that shared goal is this, it's to reduce death and disability caused by emergency conditions in our communities. And so that is why we're here. That is why we're here. That's why we build systems of care and that's why we implement them. And oh, by the way, you don't have to take my word for it. This stuff really does work. So systems of emergency care, the way I like to think about them is this is really the right care for the right patient at the right time. Um, and doing so in a manner uh, where we are we are really minimizing time lag, increasing efficiency, and not delaying diagnosis and treatment. There are many, many common emergency medical systems of care that are out there. As you heard me mention a moment ago, I think the most common quintessential one that we tend to think about are probably our trauma systems of care. Uh, the trauma network uh, that has evolved over the past half a century or more uh, in North America and the US and Canada is really built on this concept of regionalization and regional centers of, of medical sophistication and excellence for which patients can be funneled into. And that model works for a number of different reasons. Uh, it's how we can ensure the masses of the population uh, can have access to the best resources possible in a manner uh, that's both cost effective, but also time uh, considering. Now, there are other examples of emergency care that we tend to think of from a systems perspective. Burn is another good one. There tend to only be several burn centers per a given region. Um, and um, we think about other, I'm gonna skip some of the emergency cardiac ones for a second and come back to them, but we think about other types of specialty uh, resources and considerations, such as pediatric and perinatal, hand, and in some cases, even eye centers of excellence. Now, the interesting thing here is that these systems and their evolution have occurred for a number of different reasons, but these are also precious resources and precious groups of talented individuals. Many of you are part of this workforce and, and they are limited both in numbers and also in uh, ability to scale. And so that's where the concept of regionalization and compiling these centers uh, into, into regional resources becomes really important. But we have to make sure that the centers that we have and the systems of care that surround them, okay, it's more than just a building with doctors and nurses and medics and techs in it. It's, it's the entire system that exists to provide that care to the patient. So take emergency cardiac care. Take the things, uh, be it coronary artery disease, acute coronary syndromes or stroke, for example. Take these situations where we know that if we uh, want to make a difference, we have to get people to these centers as quickly as possible. And the proliferation of, of cardiac centers in particular is a good example of how technologies and newer scientific discoveries will inform and continue to inform how our systems evolve. This is, this is one of the key points of, of today's talk, which is that better systems mean better outcomes, okay? Notice what I didn't say is more systems mean better outcomes. Sometimes that's true, but better systems, better performing systems mean better outcomes. And that's why there is such a focus on this. And that's why I'm spending time talking with you about today. And you don't have to take my word for it. The scientific literature is very clear. And the, there's a, a pretty substantial body of literature that demonstrates that well-organized systems of care for time critical conditions lead to better outcomes. And that is one of the cornerstones for why we have a systems-based model and why we will continue to. It's just that important. But it's important that we remember one thing. Systems are about the people, not just about the process or the components or the sum of the parts. Systems are about the people who make up this workforce. And oh, by the way, we're not making widgets. We're not in a factory making inanimate products. We're talking about the lives of people as well. So this is really systems of people helping people. And when these people come together, each with specific roles and a common goal, we can improve outcomes. Close your eyes for a minute and imagine a pit car, a pit crew on, on like a NASCAR race or, or a, a race car uh, type of scenario where each member of that pit crew knows exactly their job, knows exactly their role, knows exactly what's expected of them, and knows what the person next to them is doing as well. 
and think about how efficiently they can do things like swapping out an engine or changing four tires or all the things that they have to do to get that car back on the line. Now, that metaphor has and that euphemism has been borrowed in cardiac arrest survival, for example, and trauma bay organizations. Um, but the concept is really important. It's about the people. Without the people, none of this works. Now, that's the hard part. These systems of people require training, collaboration, communication, coordination. The system only works if everyone in it knows its role, knows what's expected of them, and understands the bigger mission that they're part of. So you could say the system doesn't work uh, unless each individual component is there. I would, I would take that one step further. I would say the system doesn't really work without the people behind it. But the human element is not without its own set of perils, challenges, and opportunities. There are a number of workforce complexities that we must address and we must be eyes wide open to. And I've listened to some of them. There's an aging workforce. There's a workforce that's in tra it's constant transition. There's a new generation of clinicians uh, who, in some cases, uh, are new to uh, emergency health care, uh, even through and just during the time of a pandemic. Uh, we have human factors issues. We have organizational challenges. We have wage disparities, staffing shortages, issues with recruitment, retention, things like attrition. We have budget and reimbursement issues, valuation, uh, and, and appropriate uh, funding of programs. And then we have system challenges, part of the greater healthcare system for which the emergency healthcare system is, is, is not immune to. And these include things like hospital ED overcrowding and EMS offload delays, uh, just for example, of some of those challenges. Oh yeah, and then we had a pandemic. And Many of us who have been doing this prior to and now through a pandemic probably have this sense of, of exhaustion and being a little battle-worn. And, and I couldn't think of a better iconic image uh, to depict that than the picture of this, this healthcare clinician uh, just, just trying to take a moment to re-energize there. So simply put, how have our systems suffered and, and become more resilient as a result of the pandemic? Well, I, I think we have to be eyes wide open to the fact that there really are no systems or processes that were designed for what we experienced over the past three years. We would like to think that our systems had some degree of resilience and some degree of being able to flex or bend and not break. But that only goes so far and went so far. And after we uh, depleted our short and midterm solutions, we found that resources were exhausted and we had really affected supply chains, uh, personnel themselves became ill, in some cases uh, chose other careers or retired early. And then we had this phenomena uh, of surges within the surge. So it wasn't just one surge, it was multiple surges. Um, and no place to disposition patients to, hospitals being full, boarding of patients in emergency and acute care spaces. And yet the demand and the expectation of society hasn't changed. So that's a recipe for a real challenge. And to contextualize a challenge such as this, I would offer these thoughts. These emergency health services systems that I've spoken about so far, they do not exist in a vacuum. All of healthcare has been affected uh, by, a pan by the pandemic and, and all of healthcare was already in a state of, of, of pretty significant strain prior to the pandemic. Emergency medical services and the pre-hospital element of the EHS system, it too is highly susceptible to multiple external factors uh, and variables, not just the internal factors related to workforce issues, but external factors as well. Um, yet despite all that, the community has an expectation. The community has come to learn that they can count on us when they need us to be ready for that next emergency. And at the end of the day, we have to remember that our goal is to safely and effectively care for time critical illnesses. That's the essential goal here. And implying, uh, or I would say employing a triage model to do this, uh, where we can identify what is time critical versus what isn't is a cornerstone of an effective system of care. So with that preamble, 
in that background, let's talk about the future and how we can use what we've all experienced, uh, the lessons that we've learned to help us build better, more robust, more agile uh, and capable systems in the future. So let's start thinking about it this way. That new person on day number one on their shift may very well be the next chief of the department or may very well be the next nurse manager or the next attending physician. So every single person is going to be a leader. Now, they may, not, they may not have a leadership role, but we need to begin to realize that our workforce members are our best assets. And these new learners, regardless of where they're at in their learning uh, process, they they are approaching uh, this workforce in a slightly different perspective. Uh, this uh, next generation of learners has uh, has grown up in a world that is technology enabled and technology uh, immersed, um, and they uh, we need to make sure that we adapt our current strategies and practices to not only educate and cultivate them, but to empower them uh, to utilize the technology and the information uh, that we have at our fingertips that we never had before uh, at any other point in history. Before we talk about the clinical environment, let's take a step back and talk about the educational approach. And let's think about our rationale and how we educate. There are a number of innovations and a number of technologies and discoveries about how adult learners learn and how we can use that information to not only embrace the new learners uh, and their needs, but also how we can use this to help with our existing workforce members for uh, for a for a re-education for for additional ongoing lifelong learning re uh, reasons. One of the ones that I'm most excited about is is the is the work being done in the field of high frequency and low intensity training. The concept of going once every year or two uh, to a sterile environment and practicing uh, practicing a, an essential skill, a resuscitation skill, for example, or learning, uh, learn, re refreshing yourself on, on, on a key knowledge area, uh, and then being expected to remember that and not touch it maybe for six or nine months and then maybe have a case or maybe not, and then do it again in two years, that doesn't really make any sense. It's not how our minds work, and that's not how we retain information. So the concept of high frequency, low intensity training is, is really exciting. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. We have to take that opportunity and we have to intersperse it with things like simulation and other tools uh, that will help teach and learn material through real time decision support methodologies, right? So that we're teaching people to practice and to learn the way we want them to practice. Simulation, virtual and augmented reality are some examples of that. But how do we balance that with the need to connect with the learners, both synchronously in real time, like we're doing today, and then asynchronously, uh, like some of you who may be watching this lecture in the future are doing? Uh, we need to think about uh, concepts such as flipped classroom, which is very different than how learners like myself once learned. Um, and we need to think about other examples that we know help convey knowledge and information in a manner that allows the learner to retain it because we are teaching and uh, existing in a world of, of information overload and people being inundated with information coming at them from a variety of media and screens and, and modalities. Uh, so case-based learning, small group learning, uh, these types of learning methodologies that are rooted in human factor science really, really are important. And again, we need to also think about the educative and evaluative mechanisms and feedback mechanisms that we can use to ensure that the learners have indeed uh, received the information, processed it, and, and can retain it and, and, and demonstrate it. So uh, it's got to be both cognitive and psychomotor uh, and equally as important and equally uh, passionate, do I feel about, is the notion we also have to think about the affective domain of learning. Right, because we are taking care of people, we are teaching people to take care of people. And if we are not front and center on the affective domain, uh, you could be technically and clinically 100% correct in everything you're doing, uh, but if you forget for even a minute that this is someone's loved one, someone's parent, someone's child that you're caring for, you're probably going to miss the mark on something. And so that affective domain becomes very, very important as well. One of the things that I would challenge each of you to do after today's webinar 
is to think about how you can be the best mentor that you can be. I remember one of my mentors telling me that you should have more than one mentor. You should have a couple of mentors for different aspects of your career and your life that you're looking to develop, that you're looking to perfect and to optimize. And that's okay. You're allowed to have multiple, and you should have multiple mentorship relationships. Being a mentor often stems, and being an effective mentor often stems from having an effective mentorship relationship and seeing the opportunity and the product thereof, of, 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 of what you can gain from that. So uh, mentorship extends out of the classroom and into the work environment, and it really is a key component in how we are going to cultivate the next generation of emergency care workforce members. So I would encourage you all to have two things, to have a mentor you can go to, and also be a mentor for someone else. And mentorship has been one of the highlights of my career and has been one of the most impactful things I've had an opportunity to help other people on their journey. And you learn a lot about yourself too in the course of mentorship. We also have to acknowledge that there is a, a very strong and very upfront and center need for collaboration through all this. We have to not only collaborate across industry and across healthcare, but we also need to think about across sectors, how we can work together to build better systems of care. Okay, so it's not just a public safety problem. It's not just a 911 pre-hospital problem or an ED problem or a cath lab problem or an ICU problem or a trauma center problem. If we want to affect better outcomes for our patients, we have to look at the entire chain of survival and see where it's the weakest and how can we collaborate and, and how can we bolster that. And the opportunity for local engagement is really something we have to do a better job at. Local civic engagement, faith-based groups. Uh, uh, there are a number of organizations uh, that have a mission to help support other organizations. And how can we do that? And how can we use that to help us? L let's take, for example, cardiac arrest survival. You know, we can build the best pre-hospital and emergency health services system we want, and they can have the most well-trained uh, telecommunicators who are providing pre-arrival instructions and, and, and telecommunicator CPR, and we can have the best first responders and the best BLS and ALS clinicians and, and really great tools and resources and equipment, and we can have amazing centers of excellence that we can transport patients to. But if the community is not engaged, and the community is not motivated to do bystander CPR, or we don't have a robust AED program to get people the care they need when they need it, the entire downstream of the system is only gonna work so well. So when we think about time critical emergencies and we think about systems of care, I think it's really important that we do so with an eye on how we can front load these systems and how we can ensure that these systems are well integrated and uh, into the communities that they serve. And that's really where this idea of collaboration comes from. Uh, there are professional associations, uh, and let us not forget labor organizations as well, uh, because as workforce members, we want to be collaborative with all of the organizations that represent our workforce. So again, we can, uh, we can identify and establish common vision, common mission, and affect those outcomes for the positive that we're looking at doing. You know, our system really is one that's in constant evolution. And that evolution won't change, and it shouldn't. In fact, it can be outright exhausting at times. But this concept of evolution is fundamentally essential to innovation. So as technology, as science, as new discoveries continue to occur, we will need to continue to innovate and to evolve. Uh, to make sure that what we are doing, what we are performing, the services and the interventions are driven not just by science and, and outcomes, but that we are also learning about how we implement these programs. And, and you know, the, the reality is this, folks. The reality is that we are now at a point in time in human evolution, human history, where we know more about the human body and how uh, disease states can affect it, both how we can prevent those for health optimization, but how we can treat them than we ever did at any other point in time in the existence of our entire human species. 
And as these advances in technology and medical science continue to drive and continue to evolve, we need to be prepared for the fact that these systems will need to evolve as well. And, and I want you to embrace this. I don't want you to avoid it. It sounds like it could be exhausting, but it could also be awesome because at some point in time, every single person who's listening to this webinar went into this line of work because of a desire to help people. At some way, shape, or form, there is some layer of a desire to help other people and the challenge of helping people who are suffering from time critical emergencies and who need emergency medical care. That challenge um, excited us all and motivates us all. And that's, that's why we're all here. So we have to be willing to embrace these evolutionary changes based upon innovation and science. We have to be careful at the same time to, I think, make sure that we're moving in the right direction and to continuously measure how our systems are performing with established metrics that we can use to guide us, but then also how we can then use that information to adjust course, fine tune, and optimize what we're doing. So today is really about this. It's really about a call to action. It's a call to action for us all to remember that we need to really bolster and motivate our workforce. We need to support the people behind the excellence and the, and the, the key emergency time critical care that we wanna provide. We need to invest in ourselves. We need to invest in each other. We need to invest both financially, but also from a time and a mental health perspective to educate and cultivate and retain workforce members. If we can do that, if we can do these things, I think we can really empower the next generation of workforce members and really excite them. This, if done properly, can really foster and help enable better resiliency in our workforce, uh, a healthier workforce, uh, and one that embraces the concept of lifelong learning. but it can't happen unless we're all in. This is only gonna work if we recognize that we are stronger together than we are as an individual. Hmm, what does that sound like? It sounds like a system to me. We are not going to succeed at helping one another or helping that person having that time critical emergency unless we really recognize the value that we, each and every one of us bring to the table and bring to the care teams that we are part of. And for those of you who are educators, I hope that this lecture will help you motivate your students and has given you some ideas. And for those of you who are clinicians on the front line, you have our utmost thanks and respect and gratitude for doing this job day in and day out. And for those of you who are system leaders or system administrators, remember we are in the role that we are in because of an opportunity that was given and because people believe in us and we have a duty to make that system better. You know, we set the tone for what happens around us every day in everything we do. This concept of setting the tone is really important. Doesn't matter what we all have going on in personal lives and, and going on outside of work. When we're in role, we have to be all in. Setting the tone for what happens around us is just that important because positive energy really, really, really is contagious. But unfortunately, negative energy is also contagious and can be deadly. So our workforce and its continued hard work and dedication to providing time critical care that's evidence driven and systems oriented is absolutely essential. So. The next time you're facing a problem, be it a clinical problem, be it an organizational problem, be it a leadership problem, I want you to reframe what you're dealing with and saying, not just I have a problem, right? But I want you to ask yourself, what is the outcome I'm really trying to achieve here? Because if you think about problems in terms of opportunities and outcomes, and this isn't just meant to be fluff and meant to be, you know, sound good on a PowerPoint slide. I, I sincerely believe this. If you think about this stuff from the way of outcomes, all of a sudden the problems become barriers that we have to overcome. Um, and, and it's really the outcome that we're trying to affect here. So as you heard me say before, 
Never underestimate the value that you bring to the organization. Never underestimate the important role that you have in being a leader. We are all leaders. History is being made every single moment of every single day. You know, the funny thing about history is it's hard to know what's really going to stick and what's really going to be memorable at the moment while you're living through it. Sometimes you're like, wow, this is really, this is really big stuff. And, and some of those moments are very obvious. Sometimes it's not obvious because we're so immersed in it. But we are all a part of history being made every day. And we as leaders are on the front lines and leading those around us. We are role models for someone, each and every one of you. There are 788 people who have tuned in at this moment in time. Every single one of you is a role model to someone and someone is watching you to see how you handle a situation. So use that as an opportunity to lead, use it as an opportunity to motivate and to inspire. And remember, we are all human. We are stronger together. And building the next generation of systems will not happen unless we're all in. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it back over to Bridget and ask her to continue. And we have a little bit of time for some questions. So Bridget, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Levy. That was an amazing informative session. And thank you for uh, for sharing all of your insight with us. And before we, we do have a ton of questions, but before we start that um, Q&A session, um, I just have a few reminders for the audience. So just a reminder about that continuing education credits, which I know everyone wants. Uh, we need to get that to check that box. Um, but for nurses, EMS professionals, respiratory therapists, um, just a reminder, it's approved for one contact hour. And for nurses and RTs, you guys need Need to go to www.saxtesting.com slash sl so it's s-a-x-e-t-s-t-i-n-g.com and for ems you should go to www.saxtesting.com slash ems um, so you'll register on the test site complete a little evaluation and then they will um you'll get that certificate immediately and you can print it off. And again, this is all being provided by Stryker. So thank you to the Stryker folks. And there is also an on-demand version which will be available um, at savinglivesnow.org. So everyone who registered for the session will get an email as soon as that's live and available on the site. Um, and it will be accredited for CEs for nurses and respiratory therapists only. And without much further ado, since we have a ton of questions, um, I'm going to hit at it. So Dr. Levy, get ready because we have some good ones. Um, so here are the, the top questions that we have here for you um, are, uh, how do you see a, um, augmented reality and virtual reality used to improve systems of care? Yeah, that's that's really an awesome question, and it's it's one of the things uh, many of us are most excited about um, the use of um, augmented reality, virtual reality, and I would add to that artificial intelligence and, and language learning models is really going to change everything. You know, it used to be that when we wanted to build out uh, systems and build the training environments, we'd have to invest very heavily in physical infrastructure to build simulation centers and training environments and ecosystems uh, that would allow us to practice, train, and rehearse uh, skills. And those are actually very important. And I feel very strongly we will always need those. But what technology, uh, VR and augmented reality technology allows us to do is to fill a gap between the basic classroom level knowledge and classroom level and, and laboratory skills and also uh, begin to use those technologies to, um, to really allow the learner and the workforce member uh, to practice in a simulation environment that is now portable and is now, um, is now more easily uh, implementable to reach the masses. So, you know, I'll, I'll use one example, Bridget, which is I I, I love simulation. And uh, 20 years ago, uh, the large full-scale high-fidelity patient simulator uh, simulation mannequins uh, were, were all the rave, and they still serve an important purpose. Um, but what we found is it took a dedicated operator to learn and master that science and to learn how to use that equipment. And, and we found ourselves almost 
spending more time learning how to operate the device than we did actually the simulation case. And and uh, I, I've seen this firsthand. And for those of you guys who run simulation centers, I want to make sure my words aren't misinterpreted. We absolutely need high fidelity simulation. That is one piece in the learning system. So when we talk about systems, we can also talk about learning of systems, uh, learning systems as, as a whole. And I think augmented reality and virtual reality will fill a gap that's needed to prepare our learners so when they are in that immersive high fidelity simulation environment they can be as optimized as possible and really focus on those high fidelity tasks that that simulation ecosystem can have so so i'm very excited about them uh in fact i was i just had the privilege of reviewing some work being done at one of the academic centers in in, in the midwest that is really doing some really cool stuff with VR for mass casualty training. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of good opportunity. And what's also interesting to me, last thought about that is, is the technology that's needed to actually power these systems is much more accessible, much more reachable now than it ever was. So uh, in, in the late 90s, uh, if you wanted to do virtual reality, it was it was space race high grade kind of stuff. There were only a few centers around the world and around the country that had it. Um, and as you know, there's this thing called Moore's law, which talks about the rate of technological advancement and growth being exponential. VR is an example of that you can go to you can go to your favorite you know store retail store and buy a VR system and do VR golf right now, and, and it won't be very long before you can do VR CPR lessons and that kind of. So 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 I think there's really opportunity there. I'm very excited about it. And well, it's actually interesting that you the, that you brought that up, Dr. Lee, because I was thinking while you were talking, like, you know, kids are playing virtual reality games, right, left and right. And yeah. it's so interesting that the technology is there and we have it. We just need to bring it into medicine more, you know, like the, the healthcare fields to be able to to do that. Because you can, you can play golf or do, you know, what they do all sorts of, I see kids like with the goggles and doing all sorts of wild things. Um, and it would be, you know, the just making that next step to making that more readily available to healthcare providers would be like, and it's, I, I think it's actually happening, right? It's it's right. happening by evolution. Um, uh, it's happening because there's a there is a population that says, why don't we have this? We need this, right? And so so when I was in medical school in the early 2000s, it started with um, people exploring virtual reality for anatomy, um, uh, for for gross anatomy lessons and stuff like that. And that has since expanded. Now, you know, think about augmented reality and how can we use augmented reality heads up displays, real time information systems to help help the workforce members in in the clinical practice environment. And we can also uh, do this really neat thing, which is we can we can train like we work and work like we train. So we use that technology uh, at our fingertips to help provide better care. Yeah, it just seems like it's in pods, like at large academic medical centers is there and at some of the smaller, um, just when I consult with different hospitals, mm -hmm. they don't have that technology. They don't even have a high fidelity SIM center. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's just that the haves and the have nots in the hospital world. And so it seems like there's little pods and it's one of those things that could be a systems of care too, of, of sharing, knowledge sharing and, and um, yeah. you know, sharing what we have. In fact, it's a great, uh, great point you bring up because a lot of, a lot of regional centers of excellence and systems have recognized the need for outreach amongst the healthcare community and, and, and leveraging their educational knowledge, skills and resources to help the communities at large. So, and, and the, you know, that, that's absolutely right. Uh, what I would say is uh, just to wrap that port that question up, it, it's a super exciting time. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity, and, and I think it's going to make us better. Agreed. Thank you. So there was another question, kind of changing gears a little bit, um, but uh, there were kind of there was a comment and a question that I'm going to meld together. So hopefully no one's too offended by what I'm doing here. But um, so how do we essentially train out? Um, unconscious bias or uh, or or conscious bias um, in healthcare. Um, there was a comment about someone saying that uh, conscious bias is still there, and you know, women going with chest pain into EDs are still being sent home, even though you know they actually are having an MI. They're not getting that same treatment that you know um, yeah. somebody else, a male, might coming in. Um, and so, how do you think you know? we work through that and we train through that and we we yeah. acknowledge it's, um well to to the person or persons who asked that question I, I would compliment them it's it's a it's a very important question uh and, and i think answering that question requires a couple of of acknowledgements that can be quite right uncomfortable for some people which is number one 
if you're a human being, you have biases. He, bias is part of the human psyche. Um, that's not an excuse for bias. It's not an excuse for inappropriate treatment. It's not an excuse or a, 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 an acknowledgement of, of that it's okay because it's anything but that. But bias and the complexities associated with bias and systemic disparities of care that have emerged over the past hundred years. Um, uh, I, I will tell you what one of my mentors said um, to me and to our entire team. He said, and this is one of the smartest people I know, he said, I don't have all the answers, but together we're going to try to find some solutions. And and I think that is one of the things I, I would I would leave the audience with is it starts with an acknowledgement. It starts with the acknowledgement that there's a problem. It starts with an opportunity to have an open dialogue, um, to recognize that that there some of the medical research that we have um, itself was based upon populations that were not representative of the whole. So the study population. So so there's multiple layers of this. It starts off with an acknowledgement. It starts off with a, being eyes wide open to the issue. I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I think as we look at data and evidence uh, to to guide us, we need to look at the populations being studied to ensure that we're making scientific conclusions based upon populations that are rep study populations that are representative of the whole. As we implement systems of care, that we do so in a manner uh, that highlights equity. Okay because it's really not about equality, it's about equity. And that's a really important thing. And, and if these words are, are uncomfortable to you, take a look, there's a lot of resources online you can learn about this stuff. But um, as, as some other of my mentors would say, that we don't know how we're doing unless we're willing to measure it. And we can't possibly improve unless we're willing to measure it. And so identifying biases, identifying ways and creating mitigation strategies includes the need to really look at the data of how we're performing. Uh, and you used some examples already, um, but but that's that's where this starts. And then we talk about education, we talk about awareness, and, and we go from there. Really, really super question. I'm glad someone asked that. Yeah, because when I was reading the question, I was thinking, you know, some of the biggest things that you realize, you know, I remember it was probably 10 years ago, I went to my first, you know, big, you know, leadership uh, training on on bias, and you all of a sudden realize when they're talking about all these things, you're like, oh my gosh, you do have all these little biases about, you know, whether it's what brand of cereal you buy, but you know, <laughs> there's all sorts of different biases that you have that you're, um, and just being that awareness and having those conversations makes a person more aware, and um, so it is, it's bringing it up and having those conversations is huge. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Uh, the next question. Um, Boy, they're hammering in. Oh, I hope we get to everyone's. Um, what are some ideas to recruit and retain people to an organization, whether it's you know fire department, EMS, yeah. hospital personnel? Yeah. So I, I think we have to, uh, you know, workforce challenges are something that we all face, uh, and, and there are a couple of internal and a couple of external variables that we have to consider. Um, uh, it, it, let me be very honest. If I had all the other all the solutions, I'd probably be on a different webinar right now. But what I would say to you all is we are all much more similar than we may think. And we all entered this workforce for a given reason or a couple of similar reasons. And when we try to recruit and retain and, and, and to, to motivate people in the workforce, think about those motivators that were there for us. And we have to see if those motivators are still relevant. Some of them will be, some of them may not be. We have to acknowledge uh, wage disparities. We have to acknowledge the fact that there are other elements of the workforce. Um, you can make more money doing other things in healthcare and not have to worry about the high risk nature of the work we do. But if you wanna impact people's lives and you want to be there and actually uh, be in, 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 the, in the mix, so to speak, when it comes to emergency resuscitation care, there's no other, there's no other way, there's no other profession for this. So, so how do we, how do we, how do we do that in a way where we recognize that, that we need to inspire and motivate people? We need to provide them with opportunities. We need to listen when we hear concerns of the workforce. And we need to acknowledge that the landscape is changing a little bit. Um, and, and so uh, this is really now more into the organizational development and leadership side of things, but certainly from a human factors perspective, we start by looking at what's motivating people, what's motivating them to stay, what's motivating them to leave, 
and what's motivating them to why they joined to begin with. And once we do that, then um, then it becomes really important. You know, one thing I would share is many of us uh, receive surveys from employers or or professional organizations that we're part of. And it's very easy to hit that delete key or to ignore that because we're all busy. Every single one of you on this webinar is super important and super busy and is 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 the center of, of what you've got going on that day. But sharing your feedback and sharing your knowledge is very important uh, so that we can begin as a systems level to look at how do we optimize things and where do we need to focus resources. Uh, every single one of us has a voice and making that voice heard is very important. Agreed. Thank you for that. Um, and our next question is, uh, all right, I'm going through them because we just got a bunch and I want to make sure. Okay, so we hit that one. Okay, so what are your thoughts on the implementation of a standalone ER? Mm -hmm. um, standalone emergency departments uh, can serve a very important role in a, in a frontline healthcare system that is um, at its capacity. Um, Standalone emergency departments bring all of the resources of an emergency department, all the advanced imaging, uh, the specially trained personnel and, and clinicians and professionals, um, usually minus the robust inpatient abilities and surgical abilities. And, and I think that um, there's tremendous value in looking at standalone emergency departments in the right systems model. I think if you want to think about this from a systems perspective, you have to ask yourself, what are the current challenges in that region or that geographic area where a standalone emergency department might be looked at? Uh, and doesn't solve a problem. There are places that are what we call medical islands, places, large communities, large areas where there aren't medical resources and that standalone emergency department can help provide that stopgap care. Uh, and it's not going to change the need for specialty care centers, but it can help be a, a vital link in that chain of survival. And it can also provide services to the community that you wouldn't always have access to. Um, from an emergency medical systems perspective, uh, those standalone emergency departments, when used properly, um, and, and, and they, they also have the ability to help um, improve uh, ambulance turnaround time by allowing those resources to stay closer to their geographic base of operations. So uh, I think they're, I think like anything else, they are a tool, they are a resource, and they are a way for us to build capacity in the system. Um, but they're not going to solve other problems that uh, particularly uh, problems such as ICU beds or things that compl uh, complicate um, uh, hospital overcrowding and boarding. Yeah, and I and I think that's an excellent point as well as um, you know I think that you know if you're in a an area that doesn't have a ton of access I think a standalone e, uh, ER is great. Um, you know one of the things that I see in in my area in particular and that we were trying to work on was communication in the uh, community related to appropriate use of an ER. But like, so when do you go to urgent care versus when do you go to the ED versus when do you go to the minute clinic? Um, and people will see wait times, you know, at the urgent care. So they're like, oh, I'll just go to the ED. It's like, well, you might be waiting like 13 hours for, you know, your splinter uh, versus just <laughs> waiting an hour at the urgent care. And um, so I know we live in a society where people want it and they want it now. Um, and then they get upset when they see their ER bill uh, or ED bill from the hospital versus it would have been much less, you know, going to an urgent care or a minute clinic. Yeah, or, you know, it goes the other way too. Uh, very well said, by the way, Bridget, I, I, you have spot on. Uh, it goes the other way too, though, is we, we see a number of people going to urgent cares to avoid emergency departments when they really need to go there. True. Uh, there are some wonderful public health campaigns. Uh, folks in Australia have done some really cool work. There's some places around the country that have done some really good public messaging campaigns about when it's appropriate to use an emergency department versus uh, a doctor's office or a freestanding uh, urgent care center, excuse me. Um, and uh, there's some good resources out there, some good toolkits. And I, I think that that public messaging and communicating public expectations uh, is very important too. Yeah. Um, so then one last question, I think we have to, oh, maybe we don't have time for it, but maybe we can chew on it all together. How do you encourage collaboration? So if there's a staff person that wants to make change or sees uh, an improvement for, um, you know, a system of care where they work, um, how do you think that that person can, can start to get that ball rolling to make that change? 
Yeah, it, it starts with, with approaching someone you trust, someone in a leadership role. If you're a leader, it's being willing to stop and listen. Doesn't matter how busy you are, make time for the people who work for you, who report to you. If you're not a leader, if you're a workforce, when I say not a leader, if you're not in a leadership or administrative role, it's know who your direct report is and think about it. But I will end on this note. Think about change you want to make in terms of the outcomes you want to achieve. And the conversation will go much smoother and much further. And with that, I think we're probably out of time. And I thank you all very much. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for the work you do. Thank you, Dr. Levy, and thank you, Dr. Joseph, for moderating this fabulous session today. We'd also like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Please note, immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, you'll be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate your feedback. Again, for the CE Certificate of Completions, Completion, nurses and RTs, please go to www.saxtesting.com backslash SL or EMS. Go to saxtesting.com backslash EMS. And again, we thank everyone for attending today's session and have a great rest of your day.